Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas to you all. So nice to see all of you here rather than saying, let's celebrate Christmas by going out and having fun with friends. Uh, especially to the PGs, those who are working in the hospital campus, those who have had a break and have been able to come because getting a break from hospital is really, really difficult. And you would have loved to stay and sleep in bed, and especially because it's a holiday, and a special holiday at that. But you've chosen to come, to be part of the people of God, to be able to worship God. And that is something really precious and something that will stay with you. Encourage you to continue, even in the fellowships, in the various campuses, as we are told about. Please make it a point to meet up with others. Shall we begin with today's word, even as we just heard the reading today? Shall we pray? Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, your mercies, your loving kindness, Lord. Thank you that you chose to reveal of yourself and your Son. And Lord, that we should be able to come before you this morning and listen to your voice, O oh Father. We pray that you will speak to each one of us individually, Lord. We know that this is another Sunday, yet, Lord, this is a day where you have chosen to meet up with us, O Lord. Lord, open our ears, O Lord. Open our hearts to hear you and to receive of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a season where there's a buzz of excitement all around. I mean, right through these last few weeks, everywhere, it's been programs and dinners and meetings and fellowships and so many things happening. And we also know that uh, it was a time where there was a lot of excitement across the world about a very special activity that was going on in Qatar. But all of the world was so preoccupied with knowing what's happening, what's happening, who's going to win, which is the winning team, which is going to be the winning team. And yes, uh, puzzles and inquiries and a lot of news and, and all, all kinds of ideas. This, this team is better. This team is going to make it a lot of things going on. And uh, there was a similar buzz of excitement as if you look at Luke. When Luke presents this, the gospel story, and the first two chapters itself, there's the sense of excitement. Lots of things happening. People's names being mentioned and what is happening to them. And uh, here we see about in the first two chapters of Luke and how he takes us, introduces us to Zechariah and to Mary and to Elizabeth and to the shepherds and then on to Simeon and to Anna. And uh, there's something going on, you know. It's almost like Luke was a news anchor, TV news anchor, and he was going to each of these places and inquiring of them and finding out what was there and reporting very faithfully. Yes, uh, he was a great researcher. The Bible says he himself says he loved to research and investigate and find out what was really happening. And that's how we got to know what's, what happened well, 2,000 years ago. Little details, but so very important for us to be able to reflect on that and and this morning, as we are reminded also of all those incidents which were happening, we would have been hearing through the week, says the, so many Bible readings about how Mary receives and the message of the birth of Jesus, birth, Jesus being born to her, and how she celebrates and worships God. And then in that excitement, she knows that there's one person who will understand her well, and that was Elizabeth, her cousin Elizabeth. And she says, let's go. And she, has, she travels a long way just to meet up with Elizabeth. And then we uh, find that transaction there. As Elizabeth only hears a greeting. And the baby in her womb jumps for joy. It's almost like one of the football fans jumping up with joy, seeing the hero coming, or hearing that the hero is coming. And that's what the reaction that is happening there. I was just also thinking, as believers, when we see another believer, do we get excited? Does something jump up within us? Does the Holy Spirit move us to be able to know that Christ is in that person? And God is working in us and reflect, enabling us to reflect that this is something 
very real in Christ in us. And it must produce that response in another believer and for us in when we see other believers. And then we hear about the shepherds, the shepherds out in the fields, and they, are, they get a mighty exposure, and they, they, the angels talk to them about what's happening, and they get a chance to see something glorious. They get free ringside seats to the greatest event in history. And that's the joy that fills their hearts, the excitement that they experience. And then Luke takes us to Jerusalem. And there, 40 days after the birth, there's the ceremony of, the, uh, of presentation of the child in the temple. And that's what uh, Luke and, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Joseph and Mary do. They bring Jesus into, baby Jesus into the temple. And there they get to meet Simeon. And that's where the focus comes now on Simeon. And who is the Simeon as the Bible introduces us? It introduces us, uh, are we having the, the slides on? Oh, anyway, it's okay. Introduces us as a devout and righteous person. Simeon is introduced as a devout and righteous person. And it says something else, you know. Uh, he's quite advanced in years and... Uh, we reflect that, what was he doing? What was his work? Evidently, his work was waiting. How do I do it? Waiting on, uh, waiting on God. Waiting for something. Waiting for the good news to happen. And as we, this morning, as we reflect on the good news, let's look also at this person, Simeon and find out what, what we can learn from this man. Uh, this man, Simeon. And we realize that he was a person, I mean, if you look at the name itself, Simeon, in Hebrew, it, require, it refers to listening, attentive listening, intelligent listening, alert listening. And he represents that to us. This morning as we reflect on Simeon, he was a man listening to the voice of God. He would have been pouring through the scriptures, trying to study hard every aspect of it, all the prophecies, the history as it was progressing, as God was intervening in their history, as God was speaking to them. He was listening and thinking through it. And we realize about this act of active listening what does it mean to us? I mean, can we have any examples? Just look at uh, Jesus. Shortly in that whole chapter, in verse 46, is the parents of find Jesus there in the temple courts. And what's he doing? He's there, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Asking questions is a very important part of listening. And whether we ask it to ourselves or we ask it openly, important for us to be able to reflect on what we are listening. Either it just goes to one ear and comes out to the other. We, act, we seem to be listening, but are we actually actively listening? And Simeon was a man who was siphoning through the word and trying to get answers to his questions. And he was getting to know something very precious. And he was getting excited about it. And what is he excited about? The good news. What is the good news? That God loves Israel. All of the Old Testament, through it all, God loves Israel. And was it only that? No, God loves the world. Was it only that? God loves you, Simeon. That was special for Simeon to know that God loved him. God had a plan for him. And that's the message for us. The news that God loves you and me is so precious. When I got to know that, that bit of news, small thing, simple, God loves you. It was transformative for me. It was such a blessing to know 
that I don't have just a God of law. I knew God as a God of law. There's so many things, this, 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 this standard to follow, that thing to be done. And I failed everywhere. But to know that he's a God of love, and to know that he loves me for not what I do for him, he loves me because he is love himself. And that helped me. It makes such a difference to my life that I don't have to be going around trying to fulfill certain laws because I know I can never fulfill it in myself. He's already loved me for it. I don't have, uh, it's not about me trying to love God. What made the change was to know that God already loves me. And I love him because he first loved me. It makes such a difference to know this amazing truth. And, and this truth is still continuing to work in my heart. I'm still trying to soak it in, trying to understand, and it's continuing to change me. I need to know that. We all need to know that. I need to keep reflecting on what does it mean that God loves us. And what else was Simeon finding out? And then through the scriptures, he came to know also that God was sending his son into the world. Now, we all know John 3.16. And we say, yeah, so what's new? But 2,000 years ago, very few knew about this amazing truth that God was sending his son into the world. Zechariah, Anna, and some others were a few who were aware of these truths. What is it? Why was it? As we look back, as we realize between Malachi and the book of Matthew, or Matthew himself, or Malachi, Malachi was the last of the prophets for whom, uh, who spoke on God's behalf in the history of Israel. And for 400 years, apparently there was silence. And it's called the silent years. Was God not speaking in those 400 years? No, I believe he was. But very few were listening. And there was a remnant who was listening. And uh, Simeon, Anna, and the others were those who were listening and knew these truths. And they were like, it was like a relay race, you know, uh, between those 400 years where Malachi is handing it over to the next generation. And that next generation was Simeon and the others. They were receiving what God had planned, the plans of God. And they were rejoicing in it and very excited. And he knew that God was sending his son into the world, and that was his expectation. And we realize that he was keenly listening. And who was it who was helping him through it? As we realize that while he was waiting, he was in the presence of God and of the Holy Spirit who was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. If he was in the Holy Spirit. He was moved by the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit wanted to take him, there he would go. And therefore, he was at the right time, in the right place, there in the temple courts, just at the moment when this couple comes in with the baby. Such a historical moment, revelation of God into his heart, into his spirit. He comes in there, he meets this couple, he knows that this is the fulfillment of what he has been waiting for. And he receives the baby and holds this child. God with us, Emmanuel. Dream fulfilled, the vision fulfilled, the life fulfilled, the promise fulfilled. 
how satisfied he would have been in his being to know, yes, this is what I am for. And that's why we get the story about Simeon. And then we realize that this was what his life was of listening, a constant listening. Are we listening? Voice of the Holy Spirit. That we may be at the right place at the right time. You and I are here at the right place at the right time. That we may be in the center of God's will and we keep listening to the voice of God. Listening to the scriptures. How important it is to be able to study the word of God. And Shelley and myself have recently been able to I, I actually felt that excitement of discovery, you know, something called a discovery Bible study. But the fact of actually discovering that we can hear God's word, we can listen to him. It's important to actually even read it aloud and listen to the words of God. It makes such a difference to us. It becomes so real to us. It moves us in our spirits. And actually, <laughs> regretting, why didn't I start earlier? Why? I'm so excited now. I wish I had done it earlier. So it, it's something that we need to be able to cultivate. Just looking at this man, Simeon, and we realize the importance of listening to God. And then as we listen to the other aspect about Simeon, when we look at him, we realize that he's a man who was waiting expectantly. He was expectant, all the time expectant. Not just listening to the Word of God, but believing in the Word of God. Believing that it will be fulfilled to him. Anna, for more than 60 years, I think she was in the temple uh, praying, fasting and praying and so 60 years of prayers, it was being fulfilled. She wouldn't pray for so long unless she knew that what she prayed for would happen. She was expecting it. Deep expectancy as we realize. I mean, when you look back at Zechariah, I mean, in the first chapter, Zechariah as... Uh, <laughs> Zechariah comes to the uh, temple and he meets with the angel and he's come there to pray. And he's come there to pray on behalf of Israel. And he's going to pray the prayer for Israel. And God speaks to them, saying, your prayer is answered. And he can't believe it. Because he had grown not to expect it. Even the prayer for his own child, for a child to be born to him. Sometimes we tend to forget. It's so easy for us to take things for granted. We pray for something and we let it go. But we need to be in expectation. We need to believe that God remembers even if we forget. So uh, the Bible teaches us to pray persistently, to pray earnestly, to pray expectantly. And so we are called to actually keep listening to this voice and expecting that God is going to work in our midst. Waiting is a part of this expectation. Waiting is a very important part of expectation. It's patiently waiting for God, waiting for God to move. In fact, uh, it's part of our faith to believe that we are praying and therefore it will be answered. I was uh, reading a quote which Ida Scudder had put into one of her diaries, in a diary, in a personal diary, and which was available to for reading. And it, uh, she wrote in there, perhaps for own, as a reminder to herself. And she had said, she had written there, if you pray for rain, go out with an umbrella. If you are praying for rain, go out with an umbrella. Go live in expectation of your prayers being fulfilled. So we need to be able to have that understanding that God wants us to talk to him and not just throw it at him and believe that he hears and he wants to answer. So we you need to wait. We don't know when it will happen. Perhaps 60 years for Anna, we don't know when it happens. 
Perhaps after we pass away, perhaps he's going to answer then. But we need to pray and believe. In fact, waiting. Anne Waskamp, he's a Christian writer, she says that waiting is the real work of a Christian. Waiting is the real work of a Christian. We are involved in so many occupations, but our real work is waiting on God. Allowing Him to speak to us, allowing Him to work all things good in His time. And then we look at the other aspect of this man Simeon as we see that he was a man who was prepared. Uh, he was a man who was prepared as, as the angel comes and speaks to, uh, John, uh, to Zach Zacharias and talking about John, that he was a man who would be prepared or rather he would prepare the people of Israel for the Lord. God's desire was that Israel would be a people prepared for him, prepared for his son, for his coming. And that was God's desire for all of us, that we be a people who are prepared. And we see actually in Simeon that he was a man who was prepared. As he says, now I can depart from your prayer. I can depart in peace, Lord. Because he had already settled in his heart and he had come to know the salvation of God. He had come to know the deliverance and he had come to know that the Lord would receive him. He was a man prepared in his spirit. And uh, we see him actually going up to uh, Mary and Joseph, and he blesses them. And then he speaks to Mary. And he speaks to Mary, and uh, this is uh, verses 34 and 35 of Luke 2. And he's speaking to them, but... Uh, He's speaking to Mary because he knows that Mary is going to be witness to some things that's going to happen. And what are those things that are going to happen? That the son, whom she, she heard so much about, is going to happen so many things, great things are going to happen. But then he says that she's, he's going to be humiliated. He's going to be despised. He's going to be hated. And a soul is going to pierce your heart. She was being prepared for what is to happen. And as uh, Jeshu reflected, a pain in the midst of joy. She had, she had heard all those wonderful things. Her son was going in the line of David. He was going to become the leader. He was going to deliver his people. He was going to do mighty things. She had mighty hopes, partly because that was the expectation of the people of the Messiah would be a political savior. But God had to prepare her for something. And God was preparing her heart even in this. So if she was marveling at the glories of what she heard, she also had to recognize and realize that God was speaking to her about important things. And that is this matter of preparation. Even Jesus speaks to the disciples and tells them just before uh, he is to be arrested and taken away. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. It's not just about celebrations and fancy things. Oh, yeah, everything is going to be great. Christmas, maybe. All of celebrations. But then God brings us to reality. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. For I have overcome the world. So we are being a people prepared for God with regard to the things of the realities in this world, the persecutions that are going to take place. If you are a Christian, you will be persecuted. So there are absolute statements in the word of God, and we have to accept and receive it and believe that the Lord is Emmanuel with us, even in and through it. And then, if, uh, the version that uh, uh, Diraj read, and which I am also reading and we are reading, the NIV and the KJV 
actually he refers to these words, you know, where he tells uh, Mary that the sword or maybe a spear will pierce your heart too. Too. Or also. That means what? I mean, could it refer to that, the fact that it also refers to the physical piercing of a son's heart? Perhaps also, and almost definitely referring to the piercing of the heart of the father. Not only would Mary's heart be pierced, but we look in the background, we realize that the father's heart, the father God's heart, was pierced when he saw his son pierced upon the cross. His hands, his nails, nails pierced, nail pierced hands to that tree or to that cross. The father's heart was pierced. And we recognize and realize that God sent his son into the world not only to be a child in a manger, born to poor parents. Yes, God made himself real to the commonest and the poorest, humbled himself that you and I may be able to know him as a personal savior. But there was more. He was not, he came not only, he did not send his son only to be a teacher, to be a miracle worker, to be a healer, to be a perfect man. But he sent him to die. He sent him to die. And if he hadn't, we wouldn't be saved. All the other things are great. Great news for us, good news for us. But if Jesus had not died, it would still be incomplete. The complete good news is that Jesus died for us. And how did he die? And why did he die? God demonstrates his love for us. The full demonstration of God's love is that Jesus died for us. And the fullest demonstration of God's love for us is that he died for us sinners. Not for good people. Not just for good people. Jesus could have died for a good person. Jesus could have died for good people. He could have offered his life for good people. They deserve it. He didn't. He did it for sinners like you and me. He did it for totally unworthy people. He did it for powerless people. And that's why it's great news. It's good news. And as for Mary, that sword piercing her heart, that was the means to her salvation. She needed a savior too. We need a savior. And that is the reason for Jesus coming into this world to die, to give up his life for us. The worst news in history was Jesus upon the cross. But it is the best news for those who receive it by faith. And Jesus did it for you and for me. When we reflect on this indescribable love, how do we respond to it? In worship to a God who is so awesome, such a good father, such a great king. And as we reflect, we also call to think about what are the responses? How do we live our lives? We're called to live our lives like Simeon did. Are we in attentive listening to the voice of God, to the Spirit of God, to the Scriptures, the Word of God? Are we walking in step with the Holy Spirit? Are we, are we people who are expectant? Are we expectantly waiting for God to show his hands, to see the hand of God in our workplaces, to see the hand of God at home, to, to see that he's a God who wants to be with us, wants to go, reveal his, himself to us through signs, wonders, whatever. Or maybe this the still small voice speaking in our hearts. Are we expecting it? Are we living or working 
waiting for God? Is waiting our occupation? I found that patience is something so difficult for me, especially when uh, in a busy OPD or, or on the road. It's not something I can do. But if God calls us to a life of patience, are we ready to be waiting, allowing God to move in our lives? Are we a prepared people? Are we prepared, when God says, prepared to meet your maker today? Are we prepared knowing that God loves us and therefore he has good plans for us? Prepared for the works that God has for us. And if we are really convinced about the good news in our hearts, are we prepared to share it with others? Shall we pray? Father Lord, we thank you and praise you. Thank you, Lord, that you reveal your great and awesome love to us, us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us children of God. How great is the love that you have lavished upon us that we should be called your children. That we should relate to you, that we should know that you have loved us first. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the indescribable gift, Lord. Enable us, Lord, to walk in that awareness, Lord, in that attention, Lord. Lord, recognizing and knowing that it is you who are calling us, Lord. It is you who are waiting for us in your own way. Give us the patient spirit, Lord, to know that you are working all things for good. Blessed be your name. And prepare our hearts, O oh Master, each moment, each day, Lord, for what you are going to do, that we may be ready, Lord, for your call, that we may be ready, Lord, for your second coming, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.